Hello everyone and welcome to the very, very first show of Youth's Voice. My name is Alice and together with Katrine I will be conducting today's interview. This show is produced by the Schumann Trainees Committee, which represents the Robert Schumann Trainees in the European Parliament. It is a democratically elected uh, organism at the, at the beginning of each traineeship session. The STC offers trainees the opportunity to enhance their experience by coordinating various social and professional events. One of the projects we've been working on for a while is this show. Blanca is one of our trainees and she actually came to us with the idea of having a show where you could ask MEPs uh, about issues related to young adults, but also in order to get to know MEPs in a different setting. And the reason why we wanted to do this project was to, to create a channel to reach young people and discuss topics that we can all relate to as young people. And some of the issues that we would really much like to, to address in these podcasts will be especially unemployment for young people and a risk of, of getting stuck in unpaid or poorly paid traineeships. And especially for young people as us, we're newly graduated and we, we just want to get our foot in the door in the job market and, and we want to know how do we acquire the skills needed for today's labor market because due to technological advancement and, and, and developments, it's, it's really hard to keep track and we want to know how do we keep developing ourselves and getting ready for the labor market. Of course, and I, I guess generally speaking, we also want to uh, see how young people could actually get involved more into politics or how to be just politically active. So for sh first show we wanted to talk to an MEP uh, who's involved with this issue with the EU labor market and that's why we approached you, Terry Renke. Um, thank you so much for joining us, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, <laughs> it's a great pleasure. Um, to those of you who might not be so acquainted with you, um, you're a German MEP and uh, you're in the European Free Alliance, also known as the Greens Group, uh, and you were the youngest female MEP elected in 2014. Indeed. Um, we wanted to have you on the show um, because we find you very relevant for these issues that we want to discuss because you're in the Committee of Women's Rights and Gender Equality and also Employment and Social Affairs. And you were the rapporteur on the report on gender equality and empowering women in, in, a, digital, in a digital age. Sorry. Uh, and you were also the shadow rapporteur on other relevant files such as youth employment and female entrepreneurship. And lastly, we would very much like to talk to you about your involvement in the hashtag MeToo campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, we know you initiated it for the European Parliament, so we would like to hear your thoughts on that, the developments of that. Um, so as we can see, we have a lot of things on the agenda. Um, so I suggest we just get started with the first questions. Yes, let's start. Uh, so given the current state of the labor market with so many technological advancements and uh, the digital single market, apprenticeships could be a good means for young professionals to obtain some of the required skills. Last week, the proposal for a council recommendation on a European framework for quality and effective apprenticeship was discussed in the Employment Committee. In the proposal, it was emphasized that the framework must establish a common definition at the EU level of a quality and effective apprenticeship. In your opinion, what are the criteria for a quality and effective apprenticeship? I mean, first of all, it sounds a little bit technical, um, but indeed, I think it's a very important proposal because we need common standards or common definitions of what an apprenticeship actually is um, and I think that there should be minimum standards that no member state can go under. So for example things like having a legally binding contract is very important because we still see apprenticeships where it's really unclear in what relationship the employer and the employee actually stand to each other. I think it should definitely provide a, a learning experience because still today many apprenticeships are actually just like traineeships being exploited you know to basically using young people as cheap labor. Um, and one of the things that I think is also really relevant is that they should be remunerated because we all know there is a very precarious group of young people who is basically doing apprenticeships, traineeships, different forms of qualifications for a very long time without really making money out of it and they live under very precarious working and, and living conditions very often. So I think that there should be amongst these um, a, a couple of standards that no member states can actually go under. 
would you say that it would be important to establish at EU level uh, as a binding obligation to end once and for all the unpaid traineeships? I think we should definitely work on that because I believe that we cannot just say that this is in the res responsibility of somebody else. And this is why as the youth intergroup here in the European Parliament we started the Fair Internships campaign because we think um, we cannot wait any longer. We have seen for years and years how many young people have passed through institutions without being paid for very important work that they have done. Um, and plus, we were also looking at the young people who actually did not get the chance of doing internships here because they were not remunerated and maybe they didn't have parents to support them or they didn't have other means in order to, to live here in Brussels or also in other places where there are EU institutions. So we thought we really need to start at our own nose, as you would say in German, and um, try to change something here in the institutions. But I believe we also need to go beyond and we need to find a legislative framework that actually makes sure sure that young people are not being exploited if they are apprentices or, or interns. Of course. Uh, on that matter, actually, uh, in committee also mentioned that businesses should play a bigger role in establishing apprenticeships. But 90% of European businesses are SMEs, which rarely take apprenticeship. How do you think we should maybe support SMEs and encourage them to take more apprentices? I think, first of all, we maybe should change the way we look at it because in many member states it's still seen as something you know the, the state does for you so to mm. find new qualified um, employees you basically just look at schools or universities or wherever and then the people will come to you I think this mindset has to change also amongst people who are running enterprises they need to see that they need to play a role into really you know um, providing the qualifications that are needed also in the future for young people um, and then if you have this as a common understanding, I believe it is possible also for smaller enterprises um, to give good apprenticeships to, to young people and to really you know, support a new labor force that has the qualifications and the skills to, for, the, for the 21st century, basically. Of course. But what does it bring to, to put it on an EU level instead of just having it at member state level? What, what kind of benefits could you get out of it as a young person and, and you're developing new skills? Like what does it bring to put an, a European dimension to it? I think, first of all, the European labour market is growing closer and closer together. So I think there will be certain discussions that we just need to have. And I'm not only looking at apprenticeships here, I'm looking at minimum standards with regards to, for example, minimum wage or with regards to pension rights, so on and so on. So I think that, in general, we, we need to have a discussion here. But also because young people are especially um, maybe ready to have cross-border experiences, I think it would be great to see more apprenticeships not only happening in one country but maybe in, in more member states and what we have seen in Erasmus is that for example students um, take this opportunity much more often than apprentices and I would like to change that because mm. I think also for people doing apprenticeships it's a great opportunity to have an experience in another EU country. Of course. And then um, after an implementation of such recommendations um, how do you suggest that we that we measure these learning outcomes how do we make sure that it actually has an impact Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that some of the standards that we are calling for are pretty easy to measure. Like, for example, are you getting money for an apprenticeship or not? I mean, that's a quantitative uh, statistics that we need to do. I think in terms of are you having a learning experience or not, we will probably need a little bit longer implementation phase and also see what works and what doesn't. Because what I'm certainly not in favor of is a one-size-fits-all approach. Mm -hmm. There will be different answers found in different regions and different member states. But I think that because it might be difficult to measure it in the end, it cannot mean that we are not even starting the process in the first place. Thank you. I think we'll move on to the next section of questions. <laughs> um, and if we keep up with the topic of, um, of labor market challenges, we would like to talk to you a little bit about um, female perspective on, on labor market challenges and how do we increase female entrepreneurships and women in the digital age. Um, so first off, what do you find the biggest hurdles as a female to make a startup or to be an entrepreneur? We still see today, I mean, if you look at studies, for example, how easy it is for, for young entrepreneurs to get venture capital, um, we can still see that it's much, much more easy for, for male applicants to actually get money in the end. Um, this is Why do you think that is? I think it's it's a set of different reasons. So one thing is certainly a stereotype that you know um, 
men are more ready to start their own business because they have more role models or because we just have this image of you know a male entrepreneur whereas in history because of many reasons women just didn't have the chance to actually do that we also see that um, women are sometimes less ready to actually take risks because um, of many reasons, because of this lack of role, model for role models, for example. And, but also one of the things that came up in a lunch that I had with the young female entrepreneurs, they said that there is actually no targeted programs for women. So very often when you go to banks, um, you really have to take the initiative yourself because there is no advertisement that is targeted at women, whereas there is a lot of advertising when it comes to such programs to men. So we would really have to change also the way that we look at entrepreneurship um, to have more women start companies. Um, but then it's also that when you actually get started, you meet a lot of um, stereotypes, you meet a lot of prejudices and it's, it's very hard um, to take the next step. Um, and then there is still this kind of um, ph philosophy that when you fail it's something that you, know, you need to take responsibility for and then run away as fast as possible. Whereas actually failing is something that you take a lot of learning from, many entrepreneurs um, say. So I believe that we need to have specific programs targeted at women, also financial programs that would give women the possibility to do so, but we also need a shift in culture to have more women actually enter this sphere. Speaking of stereotyping men and women, do you think the, the recent proposal from the Commission regarding work-life balance could make a, a difference in this area? Definitely. I still think that um, when we look at who is taking care of work, who is you know, taking care of children, who is taking care of elderly people in society, it's still the, the big, big majority of women who are doing that. And that is, of course, um, very often creating difficulties, not only in the labor market, but also when you want to start your, your own company. Um, so I would say that if we have a more balanced approach, um, if, for example, men would take more responsibility there, it would actually profit not only the women and the men, I believe, but also society altogether. Um, plus, I think we need to have also the state that takes responsibility here, because we still have member states, like for example Germany, where um, you cannot find uh, proper care for children under, under three. Uh, and I think that this is something that also from the European level we need to push, that we have set targets and member states need to, to meet them. And how do you think, um, when the proposal will be um, worked with in the parliament, what will you push for with the work-life balance initiative? What do you mean specifically with um, regards to um, paternal... For, for example, um, putting a focus on, on gender pay gaps, um, how to use the commission proposal to, to equalize that? I think that would maybe even need an additional legislative <laughs> proposal. Um, I mean, one of the things that we have called for as the parliament in the past when we were talking about the maternity leave directive was to have, when you have parental leave, to have it um, shared by the two, um, the two parents. Mm -hmm. And I still think that this is something that we should really push for. Because in the end, having a child is not just something that you know, one person should be fully responsible for, but when there are two parents, both of them should take time off and also have this possibility. Because what we have seen is that many fathers also would like to take time off, but in their company environment, it's seen as something as if they are not putting enough energy or enthusiasm in their work. And I think this we can only change if there are legal incentives for parents to really divide the work um, equally amongst themselves. And um, so I still think that this is something that we should fight for. And maybe it's not going to happen with this proposal, but I think in the long run um, we should keep nagging there. It is a long history that should yes. be changed yes. in these uh, stereotypes. Um, I also read on, on this report um, by you that um, uh, the gender equality and empowering women in the digital age, that we should focus on the digital strategy for Europe and how that can also improve women's uh, involvement in the in digital subjects. Can you explain a bit more about that? Indeed. Um, when I was mentioning these targeted programs, um, it's certainly one of the, 
I think crucial questions, where do we put the money? And now we have um, a strategy, we also have funds available for you know, making Europe fit for the digital revolution that <laughs> is coming our way. And um, very often this is purely seen as something that has to do with technology. So basically we need to expand broadband and then, then everything will go fine. Whereas I believe this whole digitalization of society is a much broader societal endeavor. So we will have to look at what effects will it have on democracy, on the labor market, but also on gender relations. And I think that when we say from the start, we will try to allocate specific funds to have women, for example, you know, take up initiatives in terms of entrepreneurships, but also to empower women with, for example, quota regulations and companies. Um, then we can make this a much more diverse and broader revolution for everyone and not be, you know, end up with a situation where basically all of this was run by white men and only in 20 years we actually realized, well, but society is more diverse than that and we will need to adjust certain things to the needs of women or the needs of older people or the needs of whoever. So I would like to start this now and I think that the state or you know, the European Commission actually has a very important role to play there mm -hmm. and that's what we were trying with this report. I think I will jump to the, the last question I have on the subject. Um, you spoke a little bit before about uh, women needing role models in, in entrepreneurship. <laughs> and um, do you have any suggestions on how we start at an educational level for this? Because I think also um, girls and, and young women, they, they need role models to, to get into to the ICT sector or to work with STEM subjects. Uh, do you have any proposals for, for how we can encourage girls to take up these subjects, which are mostly dominant by male? Well, you know, the absurd situation is that actually there are so many role models. So, you know, it's not only Ada Lovelace, it's so many women who have actually pioneered computer science, yeah? Um, and when you look at the numbers of um, people who were uh, studying computer science in the 70s in the US uh, compared to today, in the 70s there were more women in these kind of subjects than today. So interestingly we have apparently seen kind of a pushing out of women of this, of this sphere. And I think we should actually highlight these very important female role models much more. So in terms of education, you know, say that uh, when computers were developed, it was not only guys, it was also a lot of women who were very much involved in this um, because I think this really empowers and gives this idea that this is not only something that is, you know, a male subject. But I also think that um, when we start uh, in schools, we really have to look at the curricula. I think Finland is a very positive example here mm. because they have basically said that there is um, mandatory um, um, uh, education in, in the field of computer programming, for example. And um, this is very important, especially because it's done in an age where if it was not mandatory, probably many girls would think, oh, I'd rather take a second language than mm -hmm. computer science. And um, I think by making it mandatory and making it very inclusive, this type of education, you can actually win the hearts and minds of many girls and women for this subject. It's very insightful, thank you. Uh, lastly, if we could talk a bit about the Me Too campaign. Um, the position you started on Change.org, I just uh, verified it this morning and it had almost 93,000 signatures, Very which is good. good. <laughs> I haven't checked it in a while, so it's good to know. Happy to. We're giving you the, the news. <laughs> so since last autumn, when the campaign was at its peak, do you think that there have been any concrete steps taken into the direction of preventing harassment at workplace? I mean, first of all, we needed to have the debate to actually start any kind of momentum. Um, but I think, and I said this many times, this cannot be the you know, final step because we are just starting something which I think will need much bigger changes than you know, just talking about it. Um, and what is happening right now is that there is an action plan being developed um, where here in the European Parliament certain things are changed because what we have seen, uh, unfortunately, is that the mechanisms that were in place were apparently not encouraging um, many women, I've only heard of female cases, many women enough to actually speak about their experiences mm -hmm. and to do something about it. Um, so some of the things that we have suggested now is um, to, for example, have mandatory trainings for MEPs and staff. 
I have spoken to many people who didn't even know that there was an anti-harassment committee before this Me Too campaign. So I think we really need to also raise awareness around the things that are already there of what kind of measures can be taken. And we are looking into establishing a, um, a network of um, counselors so that in a very anonymous and very low level way and um, people who have experienced sexual harassment can actually go up to someone and speak about their experiences also to have psychological and medical support but also in the end legal support because I think that when these things happen they should also have consequences for perpetrators and that's why I believe um, the victims should get all the legal support there is uh, in order to you know also bring cases in front of courts in the end because mm -hmm. I think that that's a very important step to change something. But getting to encouraging the victims to come forward, I think it's very difficult because especially for women, we, we tend to get into our heads thinking, oh, I don't want to make a drama out of it, this is not important, it, it was just a phase, it will pass. How do we get victims to actually speak? Because I, I think the whole... Uh, administrative system may be sometimes deterring victims to come forward. Actually speak up, yes. And, I mean, the first thing is to create an environment where exactly these kind of arguments are not brought up. You know, don't create this drama or, mm -hmm. or you know, asking questions like what were you wearing, had you been drinking alcohol or things like this. Because this exactly gives this image, you know, actually it's your problem, it's your mm -hmm. individual thing and it's not like a structural issue that we actually, as a you know, institution need to deal with. Um, so I think that having this debate was already a first very important step. But then what is absolutely crucial is that when there are cases, that they are handled in a very sensitive manner. Um, because if in the end the victims feel that, um, you know, basically they, it had negative consequences for them rather than for the perpetrator, it will eventually deter other people from speaking up. Um, and that's why, I, as I said, I really believe that speaking up was a first very important step, but it cannot be the last. And now we need to have from the leadership of this parliament a very clear set of measures being implemented that say very clearly we have a zero tolerance to any form of harassment and specifically sexual harassment in this parliament. Thank you very much for your input. Now we should maybe pass to our more light-hearted section a bit <laughs> because our trainees did have some curiosities, if you would be so kind to humor us a bit. <laughs> so first question from Erna, uh, which animal do you identify yourself with and why? <laughs> It's a very interesting question. We used to, I come from a youth organization, the Young Greens, and we used to ask this question when people were running for, oh. for positions. <laughs> uh, and I usually say that um, I really like manatees, but many people don't know manatees. You know, it's like these sea cows living in Florida yeah. in the Gulf yeah. of Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I also really like elephants because they're very social animals. And I'm also trying to grow a little bit of a thicker skin and um, still be very sensitive. And I think that's what elephants really stand for. So I'd say elephant. I agree. <laughs> um, I would like to know which German dishes you miss the most when you're in Brussels. I'm going to say something very stereotypical now, but <laughs> every German I know misses German bread when we go abroad. So this is really like, I don't know, it's hard to find good bread, not only in Brussels, but basically everywhere, I would say. Do you mean the bread rich in fiber? Yes, yeah. and you know, not like this. I'm from white Denmark. Bread. I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe in Denmark, I wouldn't have that much of a problem. But here, it's like only this this white bread. I, it doesn't give me the same feeling. So yeah. <laughs> familiar. <laughs> uh, Kristen wants to know when was the last time you did something for the first time, and what was it? When was the last time I did something for the first time? Maybe a first experience, or tried new sports, or. Actually, it was, uh, I was in Tenerife for holidays this year, and I did stand-up paddling. And I thought it would be very, very difficult, but it's actually not that difficult, and it's worth oh. trying it. So if anybody ever has the chance, <laughs> try stand-up paddling. It's good. Great advice. <laughs> Sounds like a fun idea. <laughs> um, if we go open one of your drawers in your office, which kind of snacks could we find? <laughs> oh, definitely chocolate. 
<laughs> Belgian chocolate? What? Belgian chocolate? Yes, also Belgian chocolate, um, but I also really like uh, Marabou. I think it's a Swedish chocolate. Yeah. That's oh. actually my favorite chocolate. So I always try to keep it because when, you know, after in a long day in Parliament, you need to have some kind of, you know, energy... Uh, Boost. Yes. Yeah. Then, you, <laughs> then I would eat chocolate, uh, probably. Yes. So just to wrap up the interview, uh, one last question. If you could go back in time, what advice would you give to your 23-year-old self? I would say make more mistakes. Do things wrong because every time I did something wrong, it actually opened a a new door for me and I really think that this idea of failure being something that you know ends your life is yeah. exactly the wrong way of looking at life because only by failing we actually realize what we want and how we can get there so I'd say be a little bit more bold and um, don't be scared of what might happen if it doesn't go right. I think we can all use that advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this was about it we could do for today. Um, so we really want to say thank you for you, Ms. Heinke. It was really appreciative to have you on our show today. And It um, was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you again. And thank you to our lovely audience uh, for watching. Please like and share and uh, just support us. And we will do more of these shows uh, pretty soon. So watch our page. And thank you again to the technical team at VoxBox here for their support. And uh, see you next time. Bye. <laughs> Bye.